Let's take a moment and enjoy this nice photo of a rhino in its natural environment. And actually, if you look closely, there's a second one hiding right here. Now, this photo was taken about a year ago by a colleague of mine when in Africa doing a electronics development project, which turns out to be a rhino tracker to save this magnificent animals. Sorry, just a quick fix here. Um, so a bit of an introduction. Uh, my name is Luca Mustafa. I'm the CEO of Irnas. We are a small company, about 15 people, based in Maribor in Slovenia, where we develop hardware solutions. So we develop connected products for industrial and medical applications. And a lot of the things we do are based on open source. So diving a bit into the history, about 15 years back, uh, just straight out of high school, I started working on wireless um, projects, so doing wireless uh, mesh networks, really getting access to uh, the people in various places. And open source was my learning ground. This is where, where I learned how to build things, where I learned about technology, electronics, software, and all that. And that has been with me pretty much the whole my professional career working on, firstly, really what I like to call the religious open source phase, where everything needs to be fully open source to the extreme. Now to a more pragmatical side of things, where we can build all the components and the core technologies in the open, which allows us to create cool projects and yeah, very helpful applications out in the field. So while we do a lot of these things um, as our core business, at the same time, we're very mindful of our environmental strategy. And this is maybe an ask for all of you. Do you have one? And if not, why not? Have a thing what you can do as an individual, as the company, or as the organization you're in. For example, what we're doing is we're producing more energy than we use um, on the company level. We have solar power plant there and are constantly improving things. Um, we ask oral clients can we build a better device for you? Or can we make this choice which will be more long-lasting while it might cost slightly more? And at the same time, we also subsidized the development of nature conservation projects. And that's what I'm talking about today. So we work with a Dutch organization called Smart Parks. Sorry, I see the logo is hidden in the corner up there. Um, so the Smart Parks organization is a Dutch nonprofit uh, which specializes in taking the technology to the field. So they are the ones that introduce the solutions. And we work with them to protect wildlife with passion and technology where we develop the technology part. So the story I'm sharing today is a interesting story for which one, unfortunately, names and locations had to be changed to a large extent to protect some very guilty parties at this point. Um, however, we can have a look at this image and see what we see here. The Smart Parks team, obviously on top of a hill somewhere in Africa, setting up a LoRa base station to create a network for all the different sensors to talk to. But what else is on this photo? There's about two rhinos hidden somewhere in the bush, probably three to five lions, a bunch of wild deer, wild buck, and many, many other animals. What we don't realize is there's also a small platoon of dedicated rangers. These are normally guys in the field with literally their boots and a uniform. Maybe they share a rifle amongst five people. And also, there's one or two poachers somewhere hidden waiting to shoot an animal they can sell. And the reality is, poachers in these locations are just regular people. They might be cousins from the rangers that are trying to protect the animals. And they get a year's worth of salary by just you know, shooting one animal and selling onwards um, what they get from that. So in the local environment, you know, that's a very, very interesting dynamic. And we can't pretend that with technology we can change this. But we can make it slightly better. So with the smart parks, for the past five years now, we've been creating the open color ecosystem. It's an ecosystem of 
hardware devices, best practices, and ways of deploying this in the field, um, such that we can give a fighting chance to the people trying to protect the animals and the animals themselves. Diving quite a bit deeper into this, we end up realizing that a lot of the animals in the field are worth more dead than alive. Just the worth of a rhino, or, well, the rhino horn, in the market, you know, sold to the finer consumer can reach hundreds of thousands of euros. Per gram, it's worth more than pharmaceuticals, than cocaine, than gold, and any other thing. For a very pseudo-like assumed benefits. You know, there's no proven benefits uh, to having it. Um, however, there's a whole ecosystem behind. And with technology, we cannot change the people, the practices, the governments, the environments. But we can empower, we can enable the organizations, the people on the ground, trying to protect these animals, um, to have at least a better fighting chance to do this. By looking on a way more technical level, the open collar device architecture is a system based on a low power microcontroller running Zephyr Artos. Why Zephyr Artos? Well, because it has all the necessary building blocks we need. So as you know, having my earnest hat on it, why going the Zephyr route instead of you know, free RTOS or any other things? Because it's one of the open projects which does not have only its core function, which is an RTOS real-time operating system, but on top of that, there's a bunch of building blocks uh, which are common features. For example, like a logging backend, a sensor backend, and a lot of very you know, technically well-defined things. But it turns out those are all the things we kept building before using Zephyr Artos again and again and again in each and every project. So as a company, you know, we had some shared libraries. We passed pieces of code around, which could be universal, could be publicly available, could be open. And this is a really excellent example of what Zephyr is doing very well. So overall, that enables us to have also a common architecture for a whole bunch of devices you've seen earlier. And this means we roll out better and products essentially better and way faster out to the field than if we develop them the old school way, so to speak. But what's the impact? We know the technology can help protect animals. But they, it's really about giving the chance to the people using it. So here we see a smart parks team uh, in Africa setting up a network. So as you can imagine, there's a bunch of these conveniently placed hills above a flat field here uh, where we can put antennas and all the sensors can talk to it. In practice, in the rhino, this actually looks like that we have a rhino horn. And I have a rhino horn here. Just to be very clear, it is a 3D printed plastic rhino horn. It's not a real thing. It's not worth anything. Files are online. You can print it yourself. Just to be very clear about that, not to make a mistake. So rhino horns you know, start from about this size, which would be the upper one. And they grow much larger up to about this size. Um, so how to build a solution which fits in here? Well, firstly, a fun fact. Rhino horn is actually nose hair. So it's nose hair with some glue kind of growing out that way, and it turns out to be a very hard and interesting substance. We can actually drill a hole into it and put something in there. That does not hurt the rhino. They don't feel it. But also, because the rhino horn is growing, in about two years, this grows out. So it's not permanently installed, falls out, and we repeat the process. So every two years, you have a chance to install a new tracker. Um, when the battery life is expanded, you repeat the process, and you know where the rhino is. Now, given all the different sizes, we start from very small, which would fit in here, pretty much in this size of a horn, 
to the medium and the large size. Obviously, photos aren't to scale. Where the large size would be this, which is, you know, fits in a palm quite nicely. Uh, what this gives us is the understanding of where the rhino is. And hard to put things at scale, but for example, a rhino can roam an area which is a few days worth of walk large. And the few people on the ground also need to walk a few days in a direction to cover that land and actually be present. Um, and when we talk about scarcity, you know, even looking at things on the map, we'll see, you know, also a made up map, not real situation, there aren't rhinos here. Um, we can see that, yeah, it's a super large area, so the person with the boots on the ground there needs to be roughly in the right area if they want to protect the animal. And given that you have about 100 times too few people in place, you really need to make sure that they are at the right place. So what do we do with the technology? We track the animals, so we, where we know where they are. We track the people, so we know where they are. We track vehicles, helicopters, all of those things, so we know where they are. And the management of these areas, they can decide, you know, you go there, you go there, we'll, we'll all be in the right um, position. But also, we can see where animals hang about. You can see the watering holes, you can see um, how they walk around, and if we look closely and go back to our story, we can see a very, very interesting point up on this map. You will see this point here. Any guesses what happened here? Something like that, yeah. If we look at the GPS track, we see that the rhino suddenly learned how to go straight. So either the rhino learned how to fly at a constant speed in a constant direction, was driving a car, or actually it was not a rhino anymore. And I need to warn you, the next slide is really graphic, so if you feel a bit sensitive about it, no shame in looking away. This is what happens. The rhino is shot, the horn is taken away, usually with a chainsaw or a hacksaw or some really brute force method. And if the rhino is lucky, it's not alive anymore at that point. But that's not for certain. And while technology does not prevent this, it makes it a lot harder a lot riskier, and it gives a bit better chance for the animals to survive. So the story goes. Because horns are tracked, you find them in very interesting states when poachers try to get them. In various metal cases or you know, with other methods. Because they fear. They fear that they're being tracked. Because horns transmit their location, some poachers are caught. Data is used as evidence. Oh, you know, it's not, I found this at the side of the road, I don't know where it's from. It has a GPS track, hey, like you carried it from there to there. So it's used in legal proceedings to crack down on this and make it harder and make it really a lot more difficult and a lot riskier. So the practical outcome here is we have more coordinated efforts. We have hard data to take legal action against people doing such actions. But also, this is a really practical use of a large number of open source components we all helped to build at some point to make a system like this work. If we unpack it, we see all the way down to, you know, LoRa gateways, some base stations running Linux, to the whole communication stacks, operating systems, and even the designs of these trackers, um, we all make that available so people can iterate. And as the, well, I don't like to call it industry, but the nature conservation 
is a really, really small field of mostly nonprofits and a few companies trying to support them being one of the most innovative fields out there because it's so much starving for new technology. So as, let's say, a high-tech company where we develop such tracking solutions for various industries, we see that our rate of innovation in introduction of new technologies is the fastest in nature conservation. It's the first place where, for example, Laura was introduced to track things out in the field. It's very early on on all the machine learning and other aspects. It's, they're so desperate trying to find solutions with super limited resources. And us as, let's say, technologists and developers, you know, often think that technology saves the problem, solves all the issues. It doesn't really, but it improves the chances of people who are out in the field. And to be really well connected, we need to understand what they're doing. So a bit about the future. What's happening? All of these devices are getting smarter. For example, we have the capabilities, particularly with Timey, ML, and all the components, that each device, like really small, really low powered, years on a single battery, can detect events. You know, can tell the difference between me having it in a pocket and walking, between an animal walking, or something else happening. We're in the development as the larger ecosystem of smaller trackers to fit on other animals, even down to pangolins and you know, very you know, small four-legged uh, indigenous devices. And the constant drive is to make things better, faster, more power optimized. And if we think bigger, you know, this reads almost like a children's story. If we take back some lessons, is that we really need to understand the fields where we're introducing the technology. And like you mentioned, in some verticals, open source is really hard for them to understand. Some feel threatened by it, some don't understand it. Um, but then again, very likely they're outnumbered in what they're doing anyway, and they're afraid of the change. So we can take what we're all building and find the best ways to apply it, but also to tell the world about it. So thank you very much. Feel free to reach out if you have questions.